already seen uh, what they are, and we will um, we will uh, look at the graphical illustration of uh, the optimality conditions. So uh, what we'll look at is we'll just uh, uh, briefly uh, go over the first order KKT conditions. Um, graphical illustrations for uh, the equality constraints, and then graphical illustrations for um, the inequality constraint. And examples I will uh, do in the next lecture. OK, so uh, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality? So this is the constrained optimum problem. We have to minimize with respect to f of x, subject to these are the inequality constraints, and these are the equality constraints. And we construct the Lagrangian, uh, which is a function of x, lambda and mu, f of x, plus lambda transpose g of x, plus mu transpose h of x, with, of course, lambda being greater than or equal to 0. And uh, so that's part of the dual feasible conditions. So these are the primal feasible conditions. If x star is the constraint optimum, it must satisfy the inequality and the equality constraints. So g of x star must be less than 0. h of x star must be equal to 0. And lambda star must be greater than or equal to 0 uh, for the inequality constraints. Mu um, is a free variable. So we must have lambda star must be greater than or equal to 0. That's dual feasibility. This is trivial. And then we have seen what complementary slackness implies. It means that lambda star uh, transpose g of x star must be equal to 0. And remember, this automatically implies that since g and lambda star are of opposite signs, they are of opposite signs, so each term in this vector in a product must be separately be equal to 0. So each, for each scalar g sub i of x less than or equal to 0, what we must have is scalar lambda sub i star g sub i of x star must be equal to 0. And then the stationary condition, uh, which is uh, derivative of the Lagrangian at x star, lambda star, mu star must be equal to 0. And these are the four first order conditions, necessary conditions, and we will be looking at these four uh, graphically today. In particular, since the first two, the feasibility conditions are trivial, so we'll look at complementary slackness and stationary conditions. And, of course, these are the sufficient conditions, the second order uh, sufficient uh, conditions for um, optimality. Okay, so now the graphical illustration. So, suppose let's uh, look at an unconstrained optimization problem. Minimize f of x. This point is the global minimum. And let's say we have a point x star. I'm not saying it's the constrained optimat, optimum at this point. So what happens is, now these, uh, this is the gradient of f of x star at uh, this point x star. Now, this is the unconstrained minimum. And these blue contours are level sets. So each of these contours represents f of x equals a constant. This is the minimum. Here, this innermost contour will be f of x equals constant for some very small value of f of x. And this is f of x equals constant for a slightly larger value of the constant. And as we move further away from the global minimum, the contours, the constant value on the right, keep on increasing. OK. So if, let's assume, the global minimum is where f of x equals 0. Maybe this contour represents f of x equals 1, f of x equals 2, 
3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and so on. These are the level sets. And now let's bring in a feasible a feasibility condition. X star is the constrained optimum, which is different from the global optimum, global minimum. Okay. Now, one thing you will notice, so X star equals arg min of f of x with x belonging to the feasible region. The gradient, this blue arrow represents the gradient of the objective function, del f of x star at this x star. Okay. And we know that it will point away from the global minimum because the gradient represents the direction of steepest ascent, steepest increase. Okay, so obviously uh, f of x is increasing as we go away from the gradient. Okay, so that's one point to remember. And the other point to remember is that this gradient will be orthogonal to one of these level sets f of x equals constant. Okay, so this gradient, this blue arrow is orthogonal to this contour exactly at this point. Okay, these are two important points to remember. It's pointing away from the global minimum and it's orthogonal to the level set. Okay, so now let's go to an equality constraint. We have minimize with respect to x, f of x, so we want to minimize subject to h of x equals 0. Just a single equality constraint. So this red curve here represents h of x equal to 0. So it's only this red curve that's feasible. Everything outside, either on this side or on this side of this red curve, has to be infeasible. Correct? Let's assume that on this side, h of x is less than 0, and on this side of this red curve, h of x is greater than 0. Only this red curve, h of x equals 0, is feasible. And I'm uh, drawing the gradient del of uh, h of x at this point x star. That's this red line. Okay, so this is our feasible region, h of x equals zero. Now, since we assume that uh, h of x is less than zero on this side and h of x is greater than zero on this side, and it's an, just one case, okay? It could be the opposite. So in this case, what's the direction of the gradient of h? It must point in the direction of increasing h, correct? So h of x is greater than 0 here, and it's less than 0 here. So it must point in this direction. h becomes positive. If we go on this direction, h becomes negative, right? Anywhere on this side, h is negative. So the gradient del h of x at this point x star is pointing in a, this direction. And remember that the gradient is orthogonal. This red arrow is the gradient of h. It must be orthogonal to this contour, h of x equals 0, this blue curve. So excuse me, the red curve. Okay, now suppose we switch the signs. h of x is greater than equal, excuse me, strictly greater than 0 on this side, and h of x is less than 0 on this side. That means the gradient uh, would be pointing in this direction. Correct? Now, I just said that del h is orthogonal to h of x equals 0, both in the previous case. And in this case, this red 
arrow must be orthogonal to this red curve, h of x equals 0. Again, in this case, uh, where again I switch the signs, this red arrow, the gradient of h, must be orthogonal to h of x equals 0. Okay, now, my claim is this is the optimum, x star, the constrained optimum. Okay. First of all, it has to be feasible, so it must lie in this red curve. Okay, and this I claim is x star graphically. Okay. And furthermore, at this point, x star, one of the level sets, you know, there are infinite level sets. I've just drawn a few. One of these level sets and the um, constraint h of x equals 0, this is sum f of x equals uh, some constant. This is h of x equals 0. They are tangents, tangential at this optimum. That's my claim. Okay, and why is that? So uh, these are the they're tangential, and we'll see why that is the case. Because suppose we have to remain in this red curve because only that's the feasible region. Suppose we move away from this tangent upwards. What will happen? You can see that we are moving further away from this f of x equals some value of the constant, right? And we are increasing. Um, f of x as we move along this direction because as we go further away from the unconstrained minimum, what happens? We are increasing the function. So this here, move away, moving away from x star along hx equals 0, so f of x is at this point greater than f of x star, right? And so this obviously, if we go along this direction, we won't be reaching the optimum. Now, if we go along this direction, again, the same thing happens because we are moving further away from the constrained optimum. As uh, you can see, this is f of x equals constant. As we move away, the value of f of um, x keeps increasing. Okay. So this point where f of x equals constant, one of the level sets, and h of x equals 0 are tangents, mutually tangential. That's our constraint optimum x star. OK? Now, since they are tangents, and we know that the gradients are orthogonal to these curves. The curves themselves are mutually tangential to one another at this point, x star. And we know that the gradients are orthogonal to the curves themselves. So this and this must be pointing either in the opposite direction, as shown here. So either del f of x and del h of x are in the opposite directions, diametrically opposite directions, or this is the case. Okay, which means that if, so this is del f of x and del h of x is in the opposite direction. Okay, so if we scale, multiply this gradient, del h of x, with some mu star, okay, what will happen with mu star greater than zero, what will happen? Uh, we can make the magnitudes equal. Okay, we can scale this red arrow so that its magnitude equals that of the blue arrow, but they're still in the opposite direction because mu star is greater than zero. Okay, then they will cancel out. So for some mu star, in this case, it's greater than 0. We must have del f of x star plus mu star del h of x star equals 0. 
that is the KKT condition, right? The um, fourth condition, stationary condition, okay? Except that in this particular case, HFx is less than 0 on this side and greater than 0 on this side, which is why mu star is greater than 0, okay? The gradients are in opposite direction. But if we switch signs like here, then what happens? Del H of x and del F of x, the two gradients are now pointing in the same direction, correct? And so in this case, what we need to do is multiply this uh, gradient of H, the red arrow, with some negative value, mu star less than zero, then it will point in the opposite direction, right? Because mu star is negative and they will be of equal magnitude so that the two will cancel out, okay? So in this case, for some mu star is less than zero, we have del f of x star equals mu star del h of x star, okay? Any questions? Yes. Um, to, uh, the stationary condition. For the stationary condition, well, both cases apply. Here, they are already in opposite directions. So, so we must apply some, we, we must multiply del H with some positive value, okay, so that the, uh, they remain in in opposite directions, but the magnitudes are the same, in which case, uh, when we add them up, we get a zero. But in this case, they are already in the same direction. So may, to make them cancel out, so we must, first of all, scale it with some mu, but this mu must be negative so that this uh, red arrow flips direction. Okay, so it will point in this direction if we multiply with something negative. In that case, they can cancel out as long as the magnitude is the same. So what I'm saying is mu can be either positive or negative. So it means when we uh, solve those optimization equations to find this unknown variable, mu will automatically adjust itself according to the equation. Yes. If you use, for instance, uh, MATLAB's fmincon, uh, minimization, uh, constraint minimization, fmincon, uh, uh, you can put um, equality constraints and inequality constraints, and uh, you will automatically get the optimum. MATLAB will solve it for you, and uh, it will give you the values of mu, uh, mu star and, um, of course, lambda star. So the dual variables, it will give you the value, and it will automatically, you will see that it will um, give you the correct sign, appropriate sign. Which can be either positive or negative. Because for an equality constraint, this mu is um, unrestricted. It can be plus or minus. Okay. As a special case, what if the gradient of H is equal to zero? Well, it's a vector, first of all. So, because this is x1, x2 plane, we are considering uh, x is two dimensional here. Okay. What if that is the case? H of x equals zero excuse me, a del h of x is equal to zero. That would not be a regular point. Okay. If you have one constraint, then it must be a rank one matrix. Okay. So, this is uh, effectively uh, the justification for a single equality constraint, h of x equals zero. So, this is the general situation. Mu star can be either greater than or less than equal to zero, but it cannot be equal to zero. Because what happens if mu star is equal to zero? That means this is the unconstrained minimum, right? Del f of x star is equal to zero. Next, we consider inequality constraints. 
we first look at a single inequality constraint. So now, this is our constraint optimization problem. Minimize f of x subject to g of x, a single inequality constraint, g of x is less than equal to 0. And so, this is g of x equals 0, this red curve here, and this side, the shaded region, is where g of x is less than equal to, less than 0, strictly less than 0, that's feasible. So, this shaded region, along with this red curve, that's the feasible region. And g of x is greater than 0 on this side, so this, everywhere here, this white region, unshaded region, is infeasible. Okay. And remember that the gradient del f of x will be pointing away from the unconstrained minimum. Okay, this is the unconstrained minimum. Now, here, the constraint is active. If this is the optimum, this red curve, g of x equals 0, and this uh, level set, f of x equals constant, are tangential. And here, since g of x is equal to 0 at this point of tangency, the constraint is active. And if you remember, what happens uh, for an active constraint? The lambda must be non-zero, right? Yes, because of the KKT condition. Yes, the... Um, exactly. The, what's it called? The uh, complementary slackness yes. conditions. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Now, why is this X star optimum? We can move uh, inside now, right? Because this whole region is feasible. Um, shaded uh, region is feasible. This F is the feasible region. We can move further inside, but then what would happen is we are increasing the value of the objective function F of X, right? So this, uh, uh, this way we are moving away from the constraint optimum x star. And as we saw before, if we move um, along um, this uh, g of x equals 0, here again, uh, we are increasing the objective function f of x. And if we are moving in this direction, again, we are increasing the objective function, which is justification why this x star, the point where these two curves, the blue curve and the red curve are mutually tangential, this is the constraint optimum. Okay, so this g of x equals 0, I repeat, and some level set, f of x equals constant, are mutual tangents exactly at this constraint optimum x star. Okay, now we know the direction of the gradient of f, it must be pointing away from the unconstrained minimum, right, away from this dot. Now, what about del g? Yeah, you had a question? Yes, what is the function for these contours? g of x is less than or equal to 0. Oh, uh, function for these contours? Yes. These blue? So, let's say this is f of x equals 0, this represents f of x equals 1, okay. this is uh, f of x equals 2, f of x equals 3, f of x equals 4, and so on. So, the constraint minimum um, uh, is where f of x equals 4, if that is the case. Okay. So, this is the direction of the gradient. And Remember, this is the feasible region because g of x is less than 0 on this side and g of x is greater than 0 on this side. Now, this red line here is the gradient of g. What can you say about 
the direction of this red line, the gradient of um, G, it must point in the direction of increasing values of G, right? And G of X is greater than zero here. If we go to this side, the feasible side, G of X is less than zero. So the in direction, of, direction of increasing G, ignore which is feasible and which is infeasible, direction of increasing G is in this direction. Correct? So, necessarily the gradient of F and the gradient of G must be pointing in diametrically opposite directions. Okay. They cannot be pointing in the same direction as was the case with the equality constraint. For the inequality constraint, they must always point in opposite directions, exactly the opposite, uh, diametrically opposite directions. Therefore, if we scale this del G of X with some lambda star greater than zero, then what will happen? The magnitudes, the lengths would be the same, but they would still be pointing in opposite directions because lambda star is uh, positive, but they would cancel out. Right. Therefore, there exists some lambda star such that del f of x star plus lambda star del g of x star equals zero. This is the derivative of the Lagrangian. That's equal to zero. Okay. And so this illustrates the uh, stationary condition for uh, a special case when the unconstrained minimum, this guy here, is infeasible. Okay. In other words, when the inequality constraint is active, g of x is exactly equal to zero at the constraint optimum. So g of x equals zero and lambda star is greater than zero. It's not equal to zero. Okay. So one of them is greater than zero and the other one of them is non-zero rather and the other one is zero between lambda and g. Okay? And so this is the stationary condition. And we just um, saw that uh, when the constraint is active, lambda star is greater than zero because g of x star equals zero implies the constraint is active. Now let's look at the other case. Again, it's a single constraint. So this is the feasible region. This is the infeasible region. But what you can see now is that the unconstrained optimum, this point here, is in fact in the feasible region. Okay. And so this is also the constrained optimum x star. Now, since this is the unconstrained optimum of um, f of x, unconstrained minimum of f of x, gradient del f of x star is equal to zero. The derivative of the objective function must be equal to zero at the unconstrained minimum. Correct? So the gradient is of f of x equals zero. So this blue direction doesn't even exist. The gradient is zero here. Okay. So what happens in this case? G of x is what at this point? G of x is something negative, right? And del G of x exists, non-zero. It's non-zero. Okay, so this, at this point, this is the unconstrained minimum of uh, f of x, which is also the constrained minimum, x star. Okay, which is what this means. So, um, argument of f of x belongs to the feasible region. The unconstrained minimum is in the feasible region. And the unconstrained, at the unconstrained minimum, the gradient is equal to zero. Now, this is the Lagrangian, del f of x 
star plus lambda star del g of x star. Del g of x star cannot be equal to 0. Uh, what would happen if del g of x star were equal to 0? Then the minimum of g would coincide with the minimum of f, correct? If del g were, were also to be 0 at this point. Now, that's one infinite uh, probability. But that also means that uh, the point is not a regular point. Okay, so when del g of x star is non-zero, in fact, it would be pointing where? Um, it would be pointing in which direction? Direction of increase, it will be pointing somewhere in this direction, right? Uh, so, if we would, this is non-zero, del g of x star, del f of x star equals zero. So, to make this whole thing equal to zero, the value of lambda star must be equal to zero. Right? So, this is the stationary condition. No, because f, not f, del f, okay. but del f the, is zero. The gradient of the objective function is zero. That's by definition the unconstrained minimum of f of x, where the gradient is zero. In other words, the direction, that arrow, is zero. So the second term needs to be zero. So the first term is zero, so the second term has to be zero. Okay, so we check the stationary condition and now look at the complementary slackness condition. Here, the constraint is inactive. It's only when g of x equals zero, that's where the constraint is active. Inside this, uh, uh, on this side, uh, that's the interior of f, right? Uh, there, the constraint is inactive. So for an inactive constraint, g of x is always strictly less than zero. It's strictly negative. And in this case, we just saw that the dual variable lambda star must necessarily be equal to zero. Okay. So again, you see that complementary slackness is being satisfied. Okay. Now, let's look at uh, this situation where we have uh, two inequality constraints. Uh, it doesn't show up here, but uh, this is shaded very light green. Okay. Now, what happens? What's the feasible region? It's the intersection of this shaded region and this shaded region, which is... Uh, it's not be, uh, fee, uh, visible, but, well, you can barely see it. Uh, you see that this, this blue becomes lighter here. This is the shaded light green. Okay. So it's the intersection of these two feasible regions. That, this is the feasible region F, where both G1 less than or equal to 0 and G2 less than or equal to 0 must be satisfied in this orange region, g1 of x is less than 0. In this green region, g2 of x is less than 0. And it's only here where both g1 and g2 are less than 0. So this is the feasible region. And one can easily argue that at this point, you have the constraint optimum. You have to move, you have to move this uh, black dot along the feasible region. But wherever you move it, you will be moving further away from the, uh, some, this contour. Okay. Now, the directions of f of x, g1, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, directions of del f of x, del g1 of x and del g2 of x are shown here, the blue, the green, and the red uh, arrows. 
this this is a constrained optimum okay can uh, let's look at uh, this is uh, i didn't draw the tangent now what can you say about the inner product or maybe the angle between del f of x and del g2 of x and del f of x and del g1 of x the angle has these angles between the blue arrow and the green arrow or the blue arrow and, and the red arrow these angles must necessarily be more than 90 degrees okay what if it were less than 90 degrees I don't have that slide, but I can just create one for you, uh, but remember this point. So, in other words, for some linear combination of del G1 and del G2 with positive arguments, uh, with positive weights, lambda 1 star and lambda 2 star. Lambda 1 star and lambda 2 star must be positive because these angles must be greater than 90 degrees. So they must be pointing away from uh, del f, somewhat in the opposite direction, uh, in antagonistic directions. OK. So lambda 1 star and lambda 2 star, for some scalars like that, the weighted combination of this must equal del f of x star. And that's the KKT condition. OK. Now, I don't. So everything put together, let me just summarize um, once again. Uh, so this is, we looked at uh, briefly uh, the case with two uh, constraints. And you can generalize the situation if you have one equality constraint, one inequality constraint, if you have uh, one, uh, if you have one uh, 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 one um, inactive uh, equality constraint. So you can look at all possible cases and you will arrive at the same conclusion. Okay, and so this is the constraint optimization problem. To summarize, this is the Lagrangian. These are the first order necessary conditions. And this is the second order sufficient condition for optimal, uh, optimality. Now, general case, suppose uh, you are faced with a COP where you have a greater than equal to inequality constraint like this. OK. In that case, what you do is just put a negative here. Correct. That's equivalent to, um, so uh, if this is the case, then that's equivalent to saying that g of x, you replace it with negative g of x. Okay, because these two must be of opposite signs. Otherwise, what you can do is, you can still assume that lambda star is greater than zero, but you can put a negative sign here. In which case, these, uh, the g and lambda are of the same sign. But we have a negative here. Okay. Now, what if we have a maximization? If we have a maximization problem, then we can either put a negative sign here, but the constraint um, lambda star uh, greater than or equal to zero remains the same, and the second order condition now becomes this. Otherwise, we can simply flip the sign of the objective function and make it a minimization problem. So you have, here you have a negative. OK, so I guess the only thing, the only point we made is uh, here, why must these angles be uh, obtuse more than 90 degrees. OK, now I wonder if, oh, unfortunately, <laughs> I know um, this is uh, a JPEG image. It's not, uh, I cannot ungroup it. 
Uh, let me draw another curve here. So suppose, let me, this, suppose this is another, uh, let's do uh, this here. Okay, and uh, shape fill, let's fill it with some other color. So let's say this is another uh, um, feasible, uh, sorry, inequality constraint. And this side, we'll call it G3, okay. So this is G3 now. And on this side, G3 is less than zero. Oops. <laughs> G3 is I'm not so familiar with this keyboard less than zero. Okay. And increase the size. Let's make it bigger. What can you say about the gradient? So the feasible region, yeah. What can you say about the gradient of this? Well, it need not be here. It can be, let's say, uh, this is the feasible region, G3. Well, this, actually, we have to make it. What can you say about this case? Uh, let me think a little bit. G3 is less than 0. Well, it again will be. Uh, suppose we make it like this. And we have, uh, stop, let me do it this way. I'll copy this part and move it. Let me select a picture here. Let me move it. Oh no. Just to make it clear, sorry about this. I realized this point only when I was. I don't know what happened again. This, I want to put it here. Okay. Now suppose, send to back. Okay, now, in this case, what happens is, the gradient will still be in this direction, unfortunately. Let me try to figure out. Oh, what I can do is this. I can make this the infeasible region. The shaded pink region is infeasible. Okay. Then what happens? If the shaded pink region is infeasible, If this is, this is infeasible now, okay, this side is feasible. 
what's the direction of the gradient? What's the direction of the gradient? I'll even bring this further on this side. Uh, this side. Yeah. What's the direction of the gradient of this second constraint? Exactly. So it will be in which direction? It will be, let's say, in uh, this is the positive, right? This is infeasible. So it will be in this direction. Correct? So the angle between the blue line, the blue arrow, and the uh, brown arrow, it's ac acute now. Yeah. Is this the constraint optimum? Not really, because if we, is this a constraint optim optimum? No, because if we go further along this direction, uh, oh shoot, what, how can I do it? Um, I have to uh, draw another, I have to do, think about it and do it properly. But what would happen in this case is this would no longer be the constrained optimum. In fact, the constrained optimum would then be somewhere in the interior of the feasible region. Sorry, I'm not able to show it in this case, but I will make a point to uh, put that in the uh, slides. Anyway, with that, sorry about this mess, but with that, I had more time. That's why I uh, used this. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, I'd have just uh, opened up. But this is the... Uh, uh, graphical illustration. So we will look at some examples in the next case, in the next uh, lecture. Okay. Even in, uh, I, maybe you know about another mathematical tool, X card GeoGebra. Uh, it has to, we don't, I don't know if we have a ECE license for that. Oh. So you can make a very nice demonstration on GeoGebra, a graphical demonstration. Really? Yeah. I see. So some kinds of, on, on a YouTube, some uh, lectures, some le instructor use GeoGebra just to explain the concept. I see. Well, that in, that's interesting. Uh, 